Basically, it's uh, ISO 95 for the authentication of uh, computer data online that, if, that uh, can be implemented there. Uh, the cost, quite frankly, is going to depend on the status of your facilities, how your systems are networked, uh, and how much security that you want to provide and how much access is going to be provided. The cost won't simply be the implementation of a software. I will say that the basic cost, if you want, if you needed to protect the assets of an enterprise, would be a firewall server. Uh, a typical firewall server would run about twelve to fifteen thousand uh, dollars, and that would protect the whole enterprise as a front end of the network. And the way that works is that on the public side of the firewall, people can interact with and see your systems, but when they execute a transaction that requires access to the confidential information, then in effect the traffic master on the public side of the firewall determines and authenticates that transaction. If it's valid, then it releases it through the firewall into the local area network and then into the appropriate system for access. So roughly that kind of system will run about fifteen thousand uh, dollars and that's a full firewall implementation along with that though there's networking strategies and other things that need to be considered as well so hardware and the basic system platform software uh, is only a part of the cost of the solution you also of course need to, to train staff to deal with network issues and so on and someone to monitor and control the audit reports coming from the server so you could see the tracks of users that are arriving at your system trying to get unauthorized access. So in effect, somebody needs to be the security administrator at your site. We have a call now from the Universidad Nacional de Córdoba in Argentina. Welcome. Your question, please. Yes, my question is, do we also have access to European information sources using the system? All right. Bernie? Yeah, the short answer is yes. It is, it is a World Wide Web, and uh, you see a lot of activity uh, from Europe and increasingly from Japan as well. But the, uh, the, the, the largest amount of web servers at this point are in the United States. And uh, I, I confirm that it's wonderful to be able to access the information from Europe, too, having recently used it. Uh, we have a call now from the Auditorio Atoyac in, in uh, Mexico. Uh, welcome. Your question, please. Thank you. What features and technical requirements should the equipment and fiber optic network comply with to transmit and receive information by way of a PC? Fiber optic network. Okay. Well, I think uh, there's a fairly lengthy explanation for that that might be better uh, answering in a written fax upon return. Fiber optic network is physical communications and so what is needed uh, at the enterprise is equipment such as a fiber optic multiplexer that will convert the traffic from your enterprise or your PC into a fiber optic format and transmit it onto that network. Uh, from a standard PC the way that might work for example is you might have a wave runner board uh, in the PC that has an ISDN capability, Integrated Services Digital Network, and that would then access out through the multiplexer, obtain a channel on the fiber optic backbone, and then transmit using ISDN. That's a fairly new technology uh, being tested now primarily by U.S. carriers, but I think there's a few ISDN trials that are starting up in Mexico and other places. I think it'll be sometime in the future before PCs readily use the fiber optic backbones directly. The typical usage is to come through a local area network and through a server where the PC accesses the server either through the LAN connection or a dial-up connection and the server manages the fiber optic connection. Okay. We have a call now from uh, uh, Hidalgo from the Universidad Tecnológica de Tula Tepeji in Tula de Allende. Welcome. Your question. 
Yes. What would be the uh, operating system that you would recommend for the Windows NC Unix uh, server, and what uh, features will Windows 95 offer for Internet access? Of course, on the birthday of Windows 95 <laughs> internationally, we have to refer to this. Uh, Jeff, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll start on that. I think that uh, clearly Microsoft being the major supplier of personal computer software worldwide clearly is, is uh, and I believe now the estimates are 80% of the market worldwide. So you would have to, using that uh, statistic, you'd have to consider that Windows 95 would be the operating system of choice. One of the reasons that you would want to do that is that the web browser software and the internet connectivity software, that type of thing, is included and embedded in the operating system in a very friendly way. As far as Unix goes, I think following the standards, the industry standards, you know, the Berkeley standards, uh, you know, the System 5 and, and on up, that following your standard Unix implementation for your servers is the way to go. That way, as those operating systems involve, evolve, that all the applications that you have running will work. Most of the major vendors, such as Hewlett Packard, Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, and IBM, uh, and so on, that supply Unix systems, all stay pretty close to the standard. So I think you're pretty safe with any of the major vendor suppliers as far as Unix is concerned, which I do believe is the operating system of choice for Internet web client server computers that run both local area networks and the wide area network gateways. I'm sorry that uh, we can't get to all of the phone calls and faxes during this show. I want to thank you all for the many excellent questions, and we now must bring this conference to a close. Uh, this is, as you recall, the third teleconference in our 1995 series on the use of telecommunications for education and professional training. Our final video conference in this series will take place on December 7th on the important subject of video conferencing and interactive communications, technology and training. We look forward to your participation in that session as well. Thank you to our experts, Mr. Jeff Smith and Dr. Bernard Dodge. Uh, you both have informed and challenged us to take advantage of and uh, the constructivist learning model, the internet, the array of communication opportunities available today for professional instruction and education. As we have noted before, the crucial value of these teleconferences is not just in bringing us together for this interaction. The real payoff of this event is in what it will mean to your employees and students and organizations in improved instruction in the future. It is not always easy to implement instructional improvements. I often find it a real nuisance, in fact. But we must make the effort if we are to stay competitive and if we are to genuinely maximize the potential of our employees and students and organizations. Good luck in that effort. We would like to invite your participation in our next video conference, The Intelligent Organization, which will be transmitted on September 14th. I'm Dr. Michael Reel. For all of us here at the International Training Center and KPBS Studios, thank you and best wishes.